Welcome to the session, everyone. It's become a bit of a tradition for me to sit down with Derek Carr and Clayton Coleman at about Thanksgiving time, KubeCon North America Commons, and to really dig into what the year ahead looks like, why we're doing the things we're doing, how it's connected to you. And um, with that, gentlemen, introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, it's always a pleasure to get together with you in person or, or virtually. Uh, here at KubeCon in the Commons. Uh, my name is Derek Carr. I'm one of the architects on the OpenShift engineering team, and I've had the pleasure of, of talking about Kubernetes and OpenShift for the audience for many years now, and I'm excited to be here again. Clayton? And uh, it's also great to be here, Mike and Derek. Uh, I love having this conversation with y'all, and it's uh, it's just uh, it's a great time of year to to gather together virtually and talk about our favorite subject, which is OpenShift. As everyone knows, we can talk about that forever. Um, you know, I've worked on, on OpenShift for almost eight years now. And, uh, you know, every year we come up with something new because the industry is changing. And so, you know, as both OpenShift architect and hybrid cloud architect at Red Hat, um, you know, I'm totally committed to, um, you know, seeing this, uh, this awesome experiment and this great ecosystem continue. And uh, I love being here to talk about it. All right. Thanks, gentlemen. And it's not just the two of you. We have Rees Oxenham, Annette Cluett, and Paul Morey popping in and out to show some product demonstrations and concepts of what we're going to be discussing. So with that, let's dig in. You know, I, I think it's best if we start our discussion around all the innovation that's happening around bringing Kubernetes out to the edge. And, and at the same time, closer to the hardware or infrastructure, whatever word you want to use. You know, I, I think it's it's probably fair to say that you two have spent the bulk of 2018 and 2019 and, you know, truthfully, even some of 2020 moving Kubernetes into this self-managed control plane. And a lot of people don't understand what that necessarily means. Maybe they're just using Kubernetes or OpenShift 4 and Kubernetes and they're not necessarily picking up on the the um, complexity of the use case that we solved for them with that uh, 2018, 2019, 2020 investment. So Derek, why don't you talk about that a little bit and, and sort of a look under the hood, if you will. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mike. So um, it's always good to come back to Commons and, and reevaluate the progress we've made. And you allude to the big pivot we made in OpenShift 4 around providing a self-managed and self-updating Kubernetes platform. And I think last year when we met and talked, we always talked about how our first cluster is the most important cluster to get into a customer's environment. But once that cluster is in your environment, you want to ensure that all the software that is used to support and run that software, uh, run that cluster uh, upgrades together and, and continues to work as a full platform. And so one of the unique uh, capabilities we have at Red Hat is being able to provide a platform from the hardware out, right? And so within OpenShift 4 today, uh, you install your cluster and you get an immutable version of RHEL, we call RHEL Core OS, that provides a platform for not just the cluster infrastructure services itself, but also your end user workload applications. And then OpenShift 4, you can go and install it in multiple cloud platforms or on premise in your environment, both virtualized and on bare metal. And we like to talk about how just taking Kubernetes isn't enough, right? To build a viable container platform, you have to surround it with uh, supporting infrastructure services. And so that might be your ingress, your DNS, uh, your monitoring stack, your logging stack, uh, a whole host of, of applications are needed to support that. And so when you deploy OpenShift 4 today, we have an opinionated set of core services we deliver with every cluster, right? And we test together as a stack in what we call a release. And so in our 4.1, 4.2, 4.3, 4.4, Four five and and hopefully now by the time we're meeting here our four six release, we've been able to install that stack into our uh, users' environments and upgrade the platform in whole, not just the Kubernetes assets, but the underlying operating system and all those supporting services. So, last year when we met, we talked about how a lot of innovation in the Kubernetes ecosystem is happening outside the core of Kubernetes itself, right? Like Clayton and I always like to talk about how we want to make Kubernetes boring and allow the innovation to happen above and around us. And I think uh, 2019 and 2020 are evidence of that happening. And one of the things that we've uh, put into the center of OpenShift 4 is what we call our uh, operator hub or the uh, uh, 
the whole notion of operators about how you can deliver extensions or add-on capabilities on top of or around that cluster uh, to get incremental value. And I know today we're going to talk about a lot of those things, but um, I think it's worth taking a step back and just being like, man, there's a lot there, right? Like uh, whether in the last year it was OpenShift virtualization, so you can manage VMs on top of bare metal OpenShift. Like who can think of that, right? Containers and VMs together managed by the same common orchestration framework. Like it's crazy. Uh, if you were to talk to Clayton and I six years ago, we'd be like, that's, that's amazing. OpenShift has grown to, to take on that use case. Or uh, service mesh, right? A lot of people are doing interesting things around uh, the Istio community to um, monitor traffic happening across their apps, or in some cases across clusters. Um, and functions, which we'll talk about later with serverless, these are all the components that we see uh, iter evolving and iterating above and beyond that core stack. And today within OpenShift 4, when you install your cluster, aside from our opinionated set of core services, our users are able to pick and choose like individual elements that they want to augment their platform with. And we provide a, a very elegant life cycling solution for those additional solutions to ensure that not just the core platform is life cycled and kept up to date and secure, but the whole uh, software stack, whether that's the core add-ons, uh, the core OS or uh, the core Kubernetes orchestration layer. So I think it's fair to say OpenShift 4 has, has grown a lot. Uh, we've proven its ability to upgrade and maintain stability in our user community today. And we look forward to doing that as we continue to evolve the platform moving forward. Yeah, thanks for that, Derek. What I really like about that, that concept is that all those features of the edge that you had to build on top of Kubernetes to give somebody a valuable platform, you've made them self-aware. You, you've moved them to CRDs. You, you, you leverage the basic functionality of Kubernetes to maintain them and to tell them that they're out of sync and that they need to come back into sync and they need to find consistency. And that was a, just a, a really great way to have a sort of a self-managed platform that's leveraging its own technologies. Really great stuff. So, so Clayton, you know, now starting in 2020, now that we conquer that world, we move into this explosion of people that want the benefits of Kubernetes, but they maybe want a smaller footprint or a, mo a more compact cluster. They want to cram it in places that Kubernetes maybe had never been before. Can you talk about some of the things we're seeing on that front? Absolutely. Uh, so over the last few years, um, Kubernetes itself has grown. You know, everything that we talked about that's a core fundamental requirement of Kubernetes cluster uh, is something that consumes resources. And um, if you're bringing it along, you need to watch it, uh, make sure it's still healthy. Um, as well, as we've added extensibility to Kubernetes, we went from a really simple initial state uh, where we just had a few binaries that we ran and everything was fine to a world where Kubernetes is actually managing a lot of the components on the cluster we run, uh, components on the node like software-defined networking, um, like the proxy elements that make sure apps can talk as um, layer on layer of um, value has been added to Kubernetes. We do need to spend um, just as much time in optimizing the platform, optimizing the components of the ecosystem around the platform, and looking for new um, efficient footprints that keep all the benefits that Derek mentioned while still giving us the flexibility to um, deliver that consistent lifecycle. Because the worst thing would be happen is if we over-optimize for a particular scenario and it breaks an, a use case that we don't want. So this has been um, this has been a pretty long journey. I've been involved with uh, performance in Kubernetes since um, the very beginning. I'm uh, guilty of some of the uh, the early projects in Kubernetes that um, made the control plane more efficient. Um, a lot of the work done at Red Hat and others in the ecosystem, we looked for ways to slim down the footprint um, of the core Kubernetes control plane. We then applied that um, to the kubelet and to elements of the operating system on there. So. Um, some great work's been done in the cryo project over the years uh, in the kubelet to really, um, even in the most complex and demanding environments, um, to slim down the resource footprint of Kubernetes itself. Um, as we went, we built a lot of infrastructure in the Kubernetes project and the, um, the OpenShift uh, engineering um, ecosystem around that to make sure that regressions were caught and captured, right? We, we watch how many resources are used by the component, by the core platform, the components of the platform. And that's something that, uh, you know, as every release goes out, um, Red Hat picks up 
uh, new versions of Kubernetes very early um, compared to uh, many of the distributions of the ecosystem. So we often find and catch those regressions and, and then make sure that they're um, they're fixed upstream in the proper way. And uh, as ecosystem components put in, um, are pulled in, we're always looking for ways of making sure that we can deliver a reliable, stable, solid platform. Um, so as we've reached the limits of what you can do by optimizing Kubernetes itself, um, we started looking at additional footprints. So um, one of the first steps that we took in OpenShift 4 was um, allowing you to run a, fully, a full, highly available Kubernetes cluster that had um, three control plane instances, but with no workers, and to actually let people schedule in those workers. That's a fairly common uh, configuration in a lot of retail and uh, edge deployments where um, power or space isn't as a premium, but you want no more hardware than is necessary. And obviously, um, you know, as we've all learned over the years, as we've gotten better with distributed systems. Um, there's really just three topologies that you can run. You can have three of something and you take a vote and whoever has the majority is in charge. Um, that's the system that Kubernetes uses with etcd, and that actually provides the strongest possible um, failure mode you can afford to lose a single instance. Um, so in OpenShift uh, 4, um, we added the compact mode where those three control plane instances um, are running the control plane as well as user workloads. We try to make it easy for people to switch between that. So if you started with three, you could add more. And a lot of that work ties into things that Derek mentioned, building a a control plane and an API system that made it easy and natural to start simple in your data center on the cloud and grow your cluster. Um, there's two simpler configurations than um, the three node control plane, and that's having a single node and having uh, two nodes in an active passive kind of setup. Uh, our focus for um, since OpenShift 4 has been um, ensuring that uh, code-ready containers, which is our single node um, development focused experience, works really well in a single node environment. And there's a lot of optimizations that go along with that, not just uh, installing the cluster, um, which sometimes takes time because we have to make sure everything's set up. In the code-ready container scenario, we can optimize for um, starting that VM image as quickly as possible and simplifying some of the steps. It's not a real production environment, um, but it actually sets the stage for some work that we're doing both in the ecosystem as well as moving um, to having uh, full single node support in OpenShift at a future time. Uh, in addition, we've been working with groups um, within Red Hat and the ecosystem on um, active passive setups. This is actually a pretty common concept for um, administrators of enterprise Linux. Um, we've been doing this for quite a long time with some of the components of Linux that do um, active passive uh, failover setups. And we think there's a lot of interesting stuff there. It's not our primary focus right now, but it is something that you can accomplish today using um, you know, technology supported by Red Hat. So we're trying to balance the needs of resource constrained environments, keep all of the flexibility and power of the platform, keep the configurability and the self-management, self-monitoring, because as you move towards the edge, if one of those three hardware instances fails, you still need a solution. And we've begun working um, as well in higher levels of the stack, like the um, Red Hat ACM product, to make sure that as you start proliferating this large number of smaller clusters, that we have the necessary support to, um, to manage the life cycle and to monitor those clusters and distribute workloads. So uh, this is something that's an ongoing project, but I'm pretty excited that um, you know, we've continued to simplify and, uh, and ship an open, uh, a fully production grade version of Kubernetes and to keep all of the benefits with none of the downsides. All right, that is absolutely correct. Like we do have some customers that have ventured forward and are doing OpenShift in remote locations. And there's really some exciting requirements that are popping up that personally I didn't think of when they first brought them to us. And it, it really is around, hey, I, you know, I don't even have staff in those locations or it's a different staff in that location with a different a sort of charter, or maybe the infrastructure services as simple as DNS or NTP aren't there. Um, Derek, why don't you talk a little bit about how we're dealing with those? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mike. So, um, yeah, I think it's been an interesting learning experience as we gather more feedback from customers on the unique constraints in which uh, they may choose to install OpenShift. Uh, and of course, as we go further out to the edge or as you deal with the realities of putting clusters in many locations of the world, you end up with uh, unique ways of, of looking at problems uh, than maybe you previously held. Uh, one of the things I'm happy about that we're doing at Red Hat is we're kind of 
uh, looking to see if we can kind of blend connected services with that broader uh, installation story so that, for example, the administrator who is putting a piece of hardware into an environment may only have to boot uh, an ISO like to just power it on. And then we can start to explore interesting concepts about, well, what happens when that machine powers on? Can we have it connect to a different endpoint and allow a different persona or a different um, uh, actor within the overall enterprise solution um, stitch these pieces of compute together to form a cluster, right? So um, I think that's a, a really interesting, unforeseen uh, new evolution around the whole installation uh, day zero, day one activities uh, that we see more and more as we get into the edge. And so there are some, uh, some exciting stuff that we'll look to show. One of these things is our assisted installer. And so uh, a lot of times today when folks think about installing OpenShift on metal or in a virtualized environment, they know that you not only just pull down our installation binary, but you pull down, you know, the ISO to boot uh, RHEL Core OS. Uh, one of the things you'll see that we're exploring in our assistant install uh, program is that uh, rather than pull down both the install and an ISO, you pull down just a bootable artifact that knows how to connect to a remote cloud service. And so today that's a service that we're offering uh, on cloud.redhat.com. And in the future, you know, we'll look to see what we can do to make it available elsewhere. But what's exciting is when you boot that first artifact, that ISO, you get uh, a way to connect and phone home to a, a remote location so that the persona or the engineer or the, the actor who's working in a retail location on a telephone pole or anywhere else that you can imagine we'd love to run OpenShift, they just deliver the hardware, turn it on and know that it will phone home to a location that allows a different persona or a different actor to stitch it together in a larger solution. And this idea of like blending together a pool of compute that you can then have a second uh, individual come in and say, I wanna stitch this machine and this machine and this machine together into a cluster is super powerful. But what's also interesting is we can minimize errors that can occur as users are kind of uh, understanding their environment by making this bootable artifact, know how to pull out and understand its its environment, right? Like what is uh, the nature of the host itself? Does it meet our minimum requirements for CPU, memory, and storage? Uh, so we can do a lot of uh, validations and verifications that the cluster will be successful before it's ever installed. Um, and we think that this is a, a really exciting emerging pattern uh, that we'll see more of in 2021. And so uh, with that, Mike, I think it'd be great to go to the demo. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I got to see this. And, and with that, Reese, why don't you come on up and take us through the Assistant Installer. Thank you, Mike. My name is Reese Oxenham. I run the field product management team here at Red Hat, and it's my pleasure to introduce the new OpenShift Assisted Installer to you all. We really wanted to make the deployment experience of OpenShift even easier. And whilst we recognize that there are many deployment options and target installation platforms for OpenShift, we wanted to provide our customers with a more streamlined and a guided workflow for deploying clusters. The OpenShift Assisted Installer is a web-based utility live on cloud.redhat.com today, ready for our customers to start using. And although it was primarily designed for the deployment of bare metal clusters, where automation can sometimes be a little bit more challenging, it can also be used to deploy clusters across a wide variety of infrastructure and cloud platforms. We set out to develop a solution that had very minimal external requirements and was incredibly easy to use. I'm going to walk you through a deployment using this new offering and hope to demonstrate some of the design goals that we had in mind. Now we're into the main workflow. We have to provide a cluster name, which is important as it forms part of the DNS domain name for the cluster. So I'll choose a name that matches the environment I want to deploy into. Next, it asks which version of OpenShift I want to deploy. And for this, I'll stick with the default 4.6 pre-release. Finally, it provides an option for me to input my pull secret, an authentication key for pulling the container images required for both installing and operating any OpenShift cluster. This has been pre-populated for me based on my cloud.redout.com login. The next page is where the bulk of the configuration will take place and the cluster name has been carried forward from the previous section. Next is going to give us the option to download a discovery ISO, 
and this represents one of the most important design principles of the assisted installer. Every node that we want to become part of the cluster needs to be initially provisioned via a discovery ISO, one that has been dynamically generated for us by the assisted installer. This was chosen for its simplicity. We need only boot the target machine with a discovery ISO, and it has a phone home mechanism where it can receive all of its instruction from the assisted installer, bypassing any manual configuration for the administrators. So let's go ahead and select the download discovery ISO button. For troubleshooting, it asks us to pull in a secure shell public key. So in the event of the nodes not appearing as expected, we can do some troubleshooting. This section also confirms whether we want to use an HTTP proxy, and if so, we can ensure that it gets injected into the ISO, but in our case, we don't need one. Behind the scenes, the assisted installer platform will now generate our custom ISO, already pre-configured for the cluster we're creating, and will make it available for our download. This takes about 20 seconds or so. I'm going to be deploying a three node cluster, where all nodes are simultaneously master and worker nodes, demonstrating a use case that is in significant demand from our customers and partners, especially for edge scenarios, and where bare metal affords customers the ability to also run virtualized workloads or workloads that can exploit hardware functionality such as GPU acceleration. For access to the cluster, I'm using a jump host that I'm accessing over VNC, primarily because I need to attach this discovery ISO to my bare metal machines over a virtual media interface. A brief overview of the setup that I'm using here. I've got three Dell FC430 blades, and I've opened up a virtual console to each of them that will allow us to monitor the progress and also attach the discovery ISO directly. We're only using three bare metal machines here to demonstrate the converged master and worker configuration, but it would be absolutely possible to have additional nodes in this configuration. So let's first get the ISO downloaded into this environment. Now that I have that locally, I can attach it to each of my bare metal machines through the virtual media interface. I'll speed this process up for the demo, but I'm just attaching this ISO directly to the virtual media interface of my three bare metal machines and instructing them to boot via the virtual CD-ROM. It's important to note that the ISO doesn't have to be used with the virtual CD-ROM. As it's a common type of boot media, it's entirely possible to use Pixie, virtual USB, or direct virtual media interfaces too. After a few minutes, these nodes should start appearing into the UI and I will go into an initial discovery phase where the agent running on the machine will report information about the system, CPU count, memory, disk availability, and so on. If we dive onto one of those nodes, you'll see that it has been correctly identified as a Dell FC430, correctly shows the 400 gigabyte solid state drive, and the network interfaces and IP addresses assigned via DHCP. The status of all of these machines is now pending input, as we have to provide further configuration before the machines will be ready for cluster deployment. Now that we have our machines ready, we can make some configuration changes to suit our needs. We have the ability to use automatic role assignment, where there's logic built into the platform to help with best fit role placement based on available nodes and their respective configuration. Here we're going to leave it on automatic as we only have three nodes and hence they'll default to both master and worker, but we can override them if we need to. There's also some additional options for each of the hosts on the right hand side of the pane. Here you can override the host name if it's not provided via DHCP. It also provides an ability to disable a node, view host events, or delete it entirely from the discovered hosts list. Next, I've got to enter the base domain of my cluster. And as this is a real environment, I'm going to match the base domain with the host names of my machines. And combined with the cluster name, this will form the full internal Red Hat domain of my new cluster. There are a few networking configurations available for us to choose from. We can either go with a basic default networking or a more advanced configuration where you can override the default subnet allocations. But here I'll stick with the basic option. There's only one network subnet that's been discovered, and that's what's showing here. My bare metal machines have multiple interfaces, but only one with DHCP. I'll use this as the base network for the whole cluster, and where my API and ingress services will listen. We're asked to define IP addresses that we want those API and application ingress services to listen on, and they'll become virtual IP addresses, self-managed and made highly available by the OpenShift cluster itself, further reducing any external environmental requirements. I have the option of entering them if I had already reserved IP addresses pre-populated in my DNS infrastructure, but if there's no reserved IPs, we also have the ability to automatically allocate virtual IPs from the DHCP service if permitted to do so. 
The DHCP server in our lab will happily allocate IP addresses to any device on the network, so I'll use this approach now. I'll select validate and save changes at this point and check that it's able to get a lease for two addresses. Here you can see I got .177 for the API and .182 for the ingress traffic. Now I'm ready to install the cluster. You see that when I previously selected validate and save changes, this has checked that everything is in order and that the configuration I've requested is valid. The machines move into a known state when they're ready. Let's proceed and select install cluster. Here you can see it takes us to the next pane where we can see that it's preparing for installation. There's also a cluster events pop-up which will give you real-time deep dive insights into what's happening under the covers. And we'll return to this over the course of the deployment to see the type of content that gets pushed here. As you can see, the nodes have now progressed into a starting installation phase. And you'll also witness that one of the nodes has been selected as the bootstrap node. This is another incredibly important design principle. We wanted to minimize the hardware footprint to reduce complexity here. We do not require an additional separate bootstrap machine for installation. The deployment process simply deploys a temporary two node cluster on two of the nodes, where the third node temporarily acts as the bootstrap machine where the installation process is executed. Then when that two node cluster it up, is up, it pivots and gets deployed as a full third cluster node, restoring full high availability and quorum to the cluster. Again, for the purposes of fitting in as much as we can into this demonstration, the recording has been sped up considerably. But behind the scenes, the two nodes that were selected as the standard master nodes will now get provisioned with Red Hat Core OS onto their root disk and, we, and will be rebooted so they can start deploying the two node OpenShift cluster itself, orchestrated by the temporary bootstrap machine. Throughout all of this, the cluster events pane can give a much more in-depth view of what's going on and can be filtered if required. Here you can see the disk write process and the state changes. Like before, if we look at the console log, you'll see the detailed list of steps that the provisioning process has taken. You can also download the installation logs for all of the machines, which could of course be incredibly useful for troubleshooting or gathering detailed information about how the cluster was deployed. Simply select the link at the bottom and your browser will download a table where each node will have its own set of log files and various other elements that may be useful. And there we go, installation has been completed successfully. We're immediately provided the console URL for us to connect to. We're provided the username and password that we'll need to authenticate against the cluster, and we're also able to download the kube convig should we want to use the CLI tools against the cluster. However, as we use dynamically assigned IP addresses, I need to quickly update my Etsy hosts file so I can access my cluster. This wouldn't have been required if I had used IP addresses that were pre-configured in the environment's DNS server. Like usual, I'm going to need to force my browser to accept self-signed certificates, but I should eventually get through to the login page, confirming that my cluster is operational. The username is the standard kube admin, and I can copy the password directly from the assisted installer page. As you can see, the cluster is still coming up and starting all of the required pods. So in the meantime, let's quickly jump over to the CLI and ensure that the kube config is working properly. I'll use the file that we just downloaded and we'll ask the cluster for a list of nodes. Here clearly showing that we have three nodes, each of which are both a master and a worker node. We can also verify the version here being a 4.6 nightly or pre-release version. From here, the cluster is fully operational and ready to serve workloads, and we can go on to deploy any other operator. As an example, because this is a real bare metal cluster, we can exploit the nature of bare metal performance and deploy OpenShift virtualization. And there we have it. This concludes the demonstration. I hope that it was useful and clearly demonstrated the new OpenShift assisted installer. Thanks for watching. Passing it back over to you, Mike. All right. Thank you, Reese. That was a great demo. And, and I'm excited about where that entire project is going to take us in 2021. Let's switch topics. Let's get into application design in a multi-cluster. We talked a lot about Kubernetes. We, but Kubernetes without an application or a reason for it to exist doesn't really make a lot of sense. So let's get in to how customers have been leveraging Kubernetes in their application services. Clayton, can you take us through some of those topics? Absolutely. The, the journey we've been on uh, from the beginning of Kubernetes, um, you know, Kubernetes was initially successful because it was uh, a set of concepts uh, in application infrastructure that made it easy for you to run applications, right? It helped you deploy uh, a container, set of code inside of that mixed with your application runtime environment, whether that was Java or a compiled binary from Go or C++ or Rust, or uh, 
source code paired to a runtime environment like JavaScript or Python. And that image needed a set of criteria for how it ran, whether that's environment variables or volumes matched up to it. And Kubernetes was kind of that, that first system that gave you just enough of an abstraction that you could write and run almost any kind of containerized application on top of it. With that came services. We added concepts um, like deployments and ingress around those, those two simple ideas. Uh, deployments let you manage the rollout of your code and pause things from rolling out further if stuff stopped working. Ingress allowed us to get traffic into the system. And alongside that, we then added stateful sets, which allowed you to run um, the parts of applications. And we added jobs and cron jobs. And as we went through this process, we started to recognize that not every um, simple abstraction was going to be great for all users. And so we had already, from the beginning of Kubernetes, thought about extensibility and how we could broaden the reach of Kubernetes to new types of concepts, whether that was how you run the app, like a workload, or whether that's an integration, like um, the way that Service Mesh provides high-level primitives for um, traffic splitting and matching um, on parts of URLs or matching the body of a request. All of these concepts, we knew they'd be really powerful. We started working on extensibility in part to provide um, new ways to run workloads, in part to provide new ways of um, binding workloads together. And then on top of that, um, concepts that we really hadn't anticipated, policy and um, new types of integrations into both the nodes or into um, the cloud environments that ran around Kubernetes. And so over the course of years, um, as we've seen applications, a lot of people started with really simple 12 factor style applications on top of Kubernetes. And they got very big. They were able to run you know, from the very early days of Kubernetes 1.0 and OpenShift 3.0 because we focused on that core problem. It wasn't the, um, the highest scale system in the world, right? We, I talked earlier about um, you know, the improvements we've made over the lifetime of Kubernetes. Well, one of the big improvements was going from 100 nodes to 1,000 nodes. Um, to tens of thousands of nodes in very specialized environments or hundreds of thousands or millions of pods. And so as these workloads grew, people gained confidence in Kubernetes and OpenShift. They began um, extending um, new types of workloads. Um, and as each new workload came in, Kubernetes was so important to the ecosystem that we really couldn't say no. So today, um, you know, in OpenShift 4, we bring in a bunch of extensions and standard parts of um, the Kubernetes ecosystem. Um, we're up to about uh, 150 individual Kubernetes resources from the very simple, I think we had 15 at the very start in Kubernetes. So there's been almost a tenfold increase in five years and the number of concepts that even a fairly standard Kubernetes uh, distribution would have. And that doesn't even get into the complexity that people build on top of Kubernetes and their pipelines of how they build and deploy applications. So I actually think we're right at the edge of a really important transition um, where we start thinking um, beyond the cluster, what are the policies and patterns and integration points that will let us run applications naturally across clusters? Everyone can do that today, right? Um, nothing prevents an organization from building and running parts of their application in different places. But I really think the next frontier for OpenShift and for the ecosystem is how we take some of those core Kubernetes concepts and we try to add concepts to the mix that let people quickly and easily uh, run those applications in many places. And if you will, bring orchestration on top of Kubernetes um, from something we all build ourselves to something we all share, which will allow that next level of um, workload to really uh, materialize for Kubernetes. Yeah. In the next topic that always comes up once they've mastered the whatever workload API they're using, whether it's a replica set or stateful set or any of these variety of combinations, they always want to know how do I do it? How do I cross a boundary, whether it's a rack or a data center floor or a cluster or whatever the case may be? Derek, can you kind of talk to us a little bit about how to think about a stretch cluster or individual clusters? Yeah, sure. So I, I think it's fair to say that there's no one size fits all solution uh, to every problem, right? Even in our dialogue so far, we've talked about how we can support running large scale Kubernetes clusters or needing to fit within resource constraints environments. And I would say like, from my experience thus far, uh, it comes down to probably three things, right? One, what is the required or acceptable failure domain? 
for uh, your deployment model. And then the second would be like, in the case of failure, what is the overall blast radius that you feel is impacted by that? And maybe the third, we don't always give enough attention to, but it's very important is like, what are the security boundaries where the cluster meets your app that need to be taken into account? And so that first question of, well, if you start out with one cluster, you're gonna put that cluster in a given data center, right? Or you might put it in a given region in a particular public cloud. Um, and even within one cluster, we get questions on, well, should I run that cluster HA and should I run uh, node pools within each uh, availability zone within that, that public cloud or within my data center within racks? And so it's, it's probably first important to ask like, or recognize that we have ways of managing failure domains within the cluster itself before you even decide to run more than one. Uh, but oftentimes, you know, you end up having to run more than one. You might run uh, an application that's globally uh, replicated. So you need to run that cluster in more than one region or more than one data center because you want to bring your workload closest to your end user. And so uh, that first real world recognition typically makes users go from one cluster to two, right? Uh, because they want to deliver that app uh, globally or uh, as close to the users as possible. When, when folks run on-prem, they might have a contract to have two data centers, like they might have an East data center and a West data center. Um, and sometimes we run into other variations of that situation where they might have two data centers that are co-located within particular um, uh, latency windows where we run into the issue of asking, like, should I do stretch? Um, so there's a lot of variables that come into this, but from a simple perspective, like if you have an East and a West data center, you probably do these things so you have separate failure domains so you can control your blast radius. And so you might choose to run two clusters. And then when the nature of that is you got to put your app on both clusters and your apps will then probably run either an active active or an active passive setup. And then a lot of real world ramifications come up to that, right? Does your app need data? Um, and do I need to make sure that that data is replicated to both environments? So today in Kubernetes, you have primitives to handle things like persistent volumes and persistent volume claims. But there's nothing innate in Kubernetes itself that says how storage is replicated, right? We have to kind of look at a layer below the orchestration platform and say, how can we do that? How can we handle that problems? Similarly, at the, above the orchestration level, we have to say, how do I load balance to my app? How do I handle getting traffic into one cluster versus another? And so a lot of the unique situations around uh, individual uh, use cases will motivate how and people choose to do things. As Clayton talked about earlier, we have you know evolved OpenShift um, over the years now to include a multi-cluster uh, management experience, which we call you know Red Hat Advanced Container Management. And no matter which choice that a customer may choose to make, whether they're running one cluster or many clusters, there's a lot of exciting primitives that are introduced in that uh, solution to both lifecycle and like provision and deprovision clusters. And then once those clusters are provisioned, you can group them, right? Like in the same way that a replica set or a daemon set can kind of group pods by label, we're starting to look at innovations around how we label clusters themselves and then define applications and policies above that. So uh, what's exciting about that is we can kind of start to treat the cluster as an atom that because OpenShift 4 is fully decoratively decorative configured, uh, configured uh, we can propagate that config across clusters. So if you have an, an east-west data center that each has GPUs and need to have things configured consistently across them both, well, that ACM solution can go and provide that management plane to do that, whether you choose to do one cluster or many clusters. Um, so it's, it's really interesting when you work through the details of why and how you end up with both either multiple availability zones within your cluster or decide to do multiple clusters. But no matter your choice, I think we can have tools today to, to meet users where they are. Um, and that last point is really key, I think. Yeah, it is. And you mentioned some east, west, north, south topics. And some customers get a little confused when they hear us throwing those that jargon around. So, so Clayton, when a customer decides that they want to deploy an application, uh, maybe a replica of itself in completely different clusters that don't know about each other, sometimes we end up talking a lot about north-south, leaving the cluster and coming back into the cluster. And then there's also some research being done about east-west staying within the same knowledge or the pod network, if you will. And can you talk a little bit about the differences there? 
Absolutely. Um, these these two phrases, north, south, east, west. If you imagine a map where um, you know your data centers or your clouds are set up horizontally, um, north, south, north is traffic coming into a cluster, and south is usually um, a way of orienting for it going back out or going to another cluster or another data center. Whereas east, west is typically in most common, you know, the thing we would use uh, to refer to inside of a data center. When we talk about east, west, we're kind of thinking about Kubernetes as a as I like to call it, um, you know, a virtual computing plane where all clusters, uh, no matter where they are, might have partitions to separate them out into different security levels or different geographic regions um, because of latency, but they're all kind of peers of each other. So east-west is cluster to cluster and north-south is coming into clusters and leaving clusters. So uh, there's a bunch of ways that people solve this problem today in Kubernetes. As Derek talked about, um, there's a lot of standard patterns that have um, carried forward into Kubernetes. Um, one of our very early uh, OpenShift customers actually ran a geographically distributed set of clusters um, all around the world in uh, Kubernetes 1.1. And they actually did a networking configuration within their enterprise that ensured that each cluster had a unique set of uh, pod addresses and a unique set of uh, service addresses, and every cluster could reach every other service. So that's maybe the simplest level of east-west, like network level configuration, but that requires a lot of pre-planning in an organization. Um, there's another level above that, which might be um, uh, specific kinds of integrations that you can do either with your network stack, your software defined networking, um, or at the level above that, at something we might refer to as um, VPN or tunneling. So the Submariner project, which um, Red Hatters have been working on, uh, helps you build VPN tunnels uh, from cluster to cluster that kind of is a level above the network and um, sits usually a level below something that's um, getting a lot of um, discussion recently, service mesh. So there's both service mesh within a cluster, but one of the goals of a service mesh is to give every service a, a unique identity and make let your applications talk without really thinking about the details. A service mesh, federated of course, can sit on top of that next level up um, and hide the details of where a service runs, whether parts of it are in one cluster or another. And then finally, at the at the top layer of East West, um, you have what I might call uh, virtual application networks. Um, so Red Hat has um, been exploring this space for a while um, through a project called Scupper, and Scupper lets you uh, connect up an individual application components without controlling the clusters underneath it. So each of these layers offers options and different performance trade offs. One of the things that I think, um, as Derek alluded to, that Red Hat would like to do is work within these ecosystems and within the Cube community. So no matter what abstraction you use, it can be standard for all of those. So if you define a service for your Kubernetes application and you want that service to be accessible on another cluster, there should be a simple way to do that, both at an administrative level and at an application level to ensure that um, you know, whether you're a development on the development side of the house or the operation side on the house, you can get your applications done depending on how much control you have. And likewise for north south, whether it involves cloud load balancers or on premise data centers, um, we'd like to help standardize some of those central mechanisms. So an application where part of it is running on one cluster, if it gets moved to another cluster, traffic should follow the application, not be tied to location. And standardizing these patterns in Kubernetes and the ecosystem will actually help us build automation in standard ways for multi-cluster apps to move between cluster to cluster without an administrator having to take action. And I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah, that is, I mean, unbelievable points. And with that, let's bring up the second demo. And what the second demo does is it takes a concept of the east-west network and it shows the performance differences that you would gain going east-west as opposed to ingressing and egressing a cluster through a routing tier. And what they've done is they've taken the replication of Ceph, the back end. This is our data services team here at Red Hat. And they've figured out how to bring up an application on a different cluster that is feeding from the replica, the Ceph replica. And with that, um, Annette, please take it away. Thank you, Mike. So we're going today to talk about OpenShift and how you could do disaster recovery, either uh, for a particular project or namespace or for an entire cluster. 
So on the left, we have uh, the current active cluster, region one, and on the right, we have a second region or a, a second data center. We have uh, OpenShift resources and persistent volumes, and the data is being asynchronously replicated over to site two. So in this demo, I have uh, a load balancer as shown in the, the previous slide and we have a common git repo that will be used via webhooks so that when a webhook is is triggered that will cause a tecton pipeline to run with a particular set of activities that will then be able to both um, scale the application as well as uh, promote and demote the storage. So we see on the bottom there that this is supported with Ceph, and Ceph is a component of OpenShift Container Storage. And we will take a look now at the application, um, which is WordPress and MySQL. So right now the application is active on site one. So just to test that I can um, recover, I will go ahead and put in a comment. And the comment then, once we're on the other side, should still be there. So we'll now look at the, um, the two sites. So on the top left is site one. And on the bottom left is site two. And then on the right, I have logged into the Ceph cluster on site one, top right. And uh, bottom right, I have logged into the Ceph cluster for site two. So if we look now at the information in the, um, what we would call an image, it will show us how the mirroring is set up. So the mirroring in this case is enabled and it is set up to do something called snapshot, which means it would be asynchronous. And on the primary site or site one is currently true, meaning the storage is being used on site one. On site two, where the data is being replicated to, the difference is it is not currently the storage, which is primary. I'm going to run a script now that will scale down the application on site one, which you can see on the top left is currently running. And when this uh, runs, it will trigger the webhook because there's a change in the repo and a pipeline will run. We can see these webhooks, which I configured in my multi-site application repo. And there is one for, e, for site one and for site two. So now let's go ahead and promote the storage on site two. So we took down site one for the application, demoted the storage, and now we're promoting it on site two. When we do that again, webhook and a Tecton pipeline is ran to do that task. The application though is still unavailable. So let's go ahead and scale site two up by increasing the replica count. We can watch the pods coming up on site two. And as we see it there, uh, MySQL is already up and WordPress is almost online. On the storage side, it is now flipped over and the primary mirror now is site two. So the storage and the application now are being accessed from site two. Now, if we go back to look at our application, we should find that it actually is back online. And we can see the comment that was added. And we can actually add 
A new comment now. Post the comment. Shows us that the storage is working on site two. So now that we've successfully failed over to site two, we want to see how we would fail back to site one. So right now the storage is primary on site two. So we'll again run a script that will trigger the webhook to run a pipeline. And in doing that, we can watch the pods on site two and soon they will start to terminate. We can see they are terminating. So now we're going to swap the storage over to from site two to site one. And to do that again, we're going to run a webhook. The webhook will run the pipeline, and in a few seconds, the storage will be swapped over. So we can check that in Ceph. We're going to do is we're going to go ahead and now that we have swapped the storage, we need to promote it again on site one. Again, this will cause a pipeline to run. The application is still unavailable. And our load balancer is actually critical right now, meaning both, both sides are not taking connections because we have not scaled up the application yet. So let's go ahead and do that. And now we can see also that our storage is primary on site one. So we'll use a script to scale the replicas on site one. And again, we'll see that that triggers a pipeline to run. And then we can come back and do a watch on the pods coming up on site one. And we actually can see that they're already running. So WordPress is now back online on site one. So let's take a look at our WordPress application. And we can see that we do have the comment that we added when we were over on site two. Over to you, Mike. Annette, that was incredible. I'm, I cannot wait until that makes it into the product. I, let's go 2021. I'm, I'm rooting for 2021. So let's switch gears. Last topic. Last topic is going to be around workloads, around developer experience. And an interesting part of this is the CNCF has really exploded in 2020 around pipelines and GitOps and build techniques. But, you know, Clayton, we've been there for quite some time. I think we got involved in 2015, towards the end of 2015 and into 2016. And from day one, we felt it was imperative that we be able to build applications inside of the cluster. And when we were looking around, there weren't too many people thinking that that was the like the right way to go. Um, why don't you take us through some of our journey and how we kind of got to where we are today? Sure, Mike. And this is a this is a great topic because it talks about how software evolves over time. And some of Red Hat's commitment is trying to help people evolve 
their organizations over time and still benefit from the latest and greatest open source. But to take into account, um, you know, there has to be solutions for this problem. So at the very early days of Kubernetes, um, I know this is really hard to imagine now, but most people didn't know what containers were. And um, the way that you built images was you pulled up your developer laptop and built those and shipped them out. And so we felt that it was really important that OpenShift um, as a comprehensive distribution for Kubernetes had a way to help developers take source code and convert those into container images. Because in Kubernetes, you can't run anything without a container image. And that process is actually a pretty common one in organizations. The development team needs to use a standard runtime environment that's properly patched, that has the right security rules around it, um, that might be scanned at an interval determined by the operations team. Combine those two together and run it. And we wanted it to be easy and reproducible. And so we uh, worked on a number of technologies that both helped you do this on a cluster as well as used Kubernetes um, as uh, a jobs engine. And again, in the early days of Kubernetes, the jobs concept was very new. And uh, co-developing the build feature on OpenShift uh, with Kubernetes, the platform, actually helped us identify places where we needed to improve Kubernetes security. And over the years, as um, as different ways of combining these technologies have emerged, as kernel, uh, the Linux kernel has been improved to offer um, some new capabilities that make um, building images in user space, much more uh, achievable because you can reuse those same fast primitives that the kernel offers for the container runtime to an end user securely. Um, we've really evolved this story and I'm looking forward to the wider, the very wide range of ecosystem components out there that meet the different requirements and we'll continue to evolve OpenShift and support the build API. So you really get the best of both worlds. You get uh, choice and flexibility and you've got um, you know, the, the option of new technologies that we'll bring in and support alongside those existing concepts. Yeah, and I mean, at the end of the day, it's really just a application service on the platform. They, they want an, an API endpoint, they want their application feeding to the world. And in that regard, Derek, we have in this last year, exploded in the number of services that we are offering as a company, as Red Hat out on cloud.redhat.com, on the Kubernetes platform, on the OpenShift platform. Can you talk to us a little bit about that experience? Yeah, sure, Mike. So um, we often like to talk about how OpenShift depends on OpenShift, right? There's a lot of uh, backend services that we've had to build at Red Hat to just support delivery of our product out to our users, right? That whole supply chain of building our own software, uh, packaging and putting it into an image registry and making it available to the world. Uh, a lot of folks might not appreciate that that's actually all running on OpenShift behind the scenes. So today, if you go to cloud.redhat.com, you'll see an ever growing list of SaaS style services that our Red Hat SRE teams are managing. And one of the key ones might be things like uh, the OpenShift cluster manager or OpenShift dedicated service. Um, as well as some of our supporting infrastructure, like uh, the Quay uh, image distribution system itself, our remote health monitoring system that's running a really uh, large uh, uh, metric sync data store that lets us know if everything in the platform is running well together and we can go and make upstream communities better as well as the projects uh, that we consume better to also make our users happier, right? So to do all these backend uh, services, when we talked about uh, failure domains and blast radius, these things apply to Red Hat just as much as our end users. And so we've been naturally having to build uh, multi-cluster services to support just the business of OpenShift. Um, what's interesting and what I admire about Red Hat is, you know, things do go wrong, right? Uh, we try to minimize our outages like every other production system in the world. But when a single cluster goes down, right, we can rally together the kernel engineers the Kubernetes engineers, the networking engineers, and try to solve that problem at a very deep level to ensure that those who run that cluster on premise or themselves uh, don't have that issue. But naturally, like we don't want a single point of failure to take down our production system. So we have to run more than one cluster. Um, and so I think we've started to see like an emerging set of patterns and practices around how to build uh, multi-cluster services um, that I, I would kind of summarize as like, uh, first deciding if your service is global or regional, right? But at some level, you put a regional microservice out there that says, this is how you interact with your solution. Uh, and then uh, 
along with that regional microservice, you need some persistence. And you know, we're running a lot on Kubernetes. And so you might be using OpenShift container storage. And just like Annette's prior demo where she showed data go active passive across locations, you need to make sure your data is not home to any one individual cluster. And then you have to tie load balancing into your clusters as we talked earlier. Um, but at some level, depending on the work and how uh, you navigate users to clusters, you're ultimately going to figure out a way to pin your workload and that instance of your workload to a particular cluster uh, where the job is actually done, right? And so if you're running more than one cluster, uh, eventually you have a way of, of pinning a request or pinning a user desired state to an individual cluster and doing action afterwards. And on each of those clusters, one of the reasons that Red Hat was so deeply invested in the operator pattern is we want to keep the intelligence for how to run that application, that that uh, that concept uh, within the cluster itself, so that it's replicated. That same logic applies everywhere we replicate it, and we know it works consistently. And so today, within OpenShift, you see tons of operators that are appearing in the operator hub that represent content we actually run today in production. So if you get Quay through the operator hub, you're starting to learn the patterns that we use to to run Quay live itself, and those inherently spread clusters. Um, but all these things together, like uh, I would say in the end, we realized that we need multiple clusters to run reliable services because our services are globally distributed and we don't wanna allow any individual cluster to have an individual failover domain or, or accident. Uh, and what's exciting is we're starting to learn a lot of patterns. We can start to codify these things as we bring them out in the future. And at the same time, like Kube keeps evolving. So a lot of times when we talked about earlier about having an active passive setup of your app, like in your passive data center, you might not, want to dedicate all of your compute to that thing that's not yet being run, right? These things take power and cycles uh, and you ultimately want to drive costs reliably. And so some of the exciting stuff I see going around is just everything around a serverless and inventing, right? So how can we scale things down to zero even when they're replicated across clusters? Uh, and I think a lot of unique innovation is gonna come out when we even look about what it means to host Kubernetes itself as these things evolve, right? It's, it's very meta. Um, but definitely for sure, we're always looking here at Red Hat about how we uh, can run the services to support OpenShift on more than one cluster reliably and uh, at good cost. That's a good point, Derek, uh, bringing up serverless and eventing. So we, we had the CNCF explosion of all the, the on-platform building, all the integration with pipeline tools, all the integration with GitOps. That flowed nicely into people building a lot of APIs, a lot of services, and wanting to really have a SaaS offering within their own company to each other, right? To, to really build this framework of this community of application processes. But it really, the flip side then becomes, how do I consume that? Right? I, I don't want to talk containers all the time. I, I just want to talk API. I just want to have a serverless experience where I'm just talking about functions, if you will. And functions without inventing, is kind of boring and we've GA'd eventing in serverless. So let's bring up Paul Mori. Uh, Paul, can you take us into the serverless world and, and show us what's going on? Thanks a lot, Mike. Hello everyone, I'm Paul Mori and I lead our serverless engineering team. As you may know, OpenShift Serverless is based on the Knative project, which has two key functional areas serving and eventing. I'm really excited today because eventing is joining serving as GA in OpenShift Serverless, so we're going to concentrate today on some concepts from eventing. Another exciting piece of news is that we now have a developer preview of functions, so we'll be working that into the mix today as well. As I said, we're going to explore some key concepts in Knative eventing. Knative eventing is about addressing common needs in cloud native development and provides composable primitives to enable late binding between producers and consumers of events. Let's talk about the central goals of eventing. We want to facilitate loose coupling and allow services to be developed and deployed independently on a variety of platforms. We want producers and consumers to be independent, meaning that any producer should be able to generate events before there are active consumers and any consumers can express an interest in an event or class of events before there are producers creating them. 
We want other services to be able to be connected to the eventing system to create new applications without modifying existing producers and consumers. And we want to enable cross-service interoperability using the cloud event specification that's developed by the CNCF serverless working group. So we're looking at the topology view in the OpenShift developer console. And this, uh, this thing called default here that we're looking at is a broker. It's an eventing broker. Um, and the event broker resource is a powerful tool to achieve the loose coupling and independence between producers and consumers of events. They basically provide buckets of events that can be selected via their attributes to send to consumers. The trigger resource is what we're going to use to express selection criteria for which events consumer wants to see. But to start, we're going to make a service that consumes and logs events so that we can illustrate how these concepts work. We're going to do this by writing a very simple function. Let's check this out. So we're doing kn faz display create display. And we're going to use the event type to activate it. Um, what this is going to do is make a template function definition that we'll look at in just a moment. Build an image for it, push the image to Quay and deploy the function wrapped in a Knative service so that we will get all the awesomeness of auto-scaling from zero to N back to zero again and the power of immutable application revision. So let's just go ahead and check out that function body. Um, it's basically one handle function. Uh, so if you are familiar with Go, and probably if you're not familiar with Go, um, this is probably seeming pretty approachable we're basically just going to print out the event that we got. All right, it looks like. So that's what the function body looks like. Let's take a look at this back in the, in the developer console. And we can see here that we've got a, <clears throat> we've got a K service for display. And just a quick refresher, service is a, very high level concept from Knative Serving. It's a type of controller similar to a replica set or deployment that creates other resources to do its work. Service allows us to specify the spec for what our pods that are run should look like. It creates a configuration resource that produces revisions, which are immutable snapshots of an application. Every time I make a change to my service, I get a new revision. Service is also a point of control for traffic split and creates the route resources that control how traffic goes into our revisions. So what I did was pretty neat because with a single command, I just got my function up and running and I didn't have to mess around with YAML or really any details. Um, so now our display function is deployed and we can start pumping some events into it. Remember how I said that we can register an interest in events before there is a producer that makes them? I'm going to do that right now by creating a trigger that will give us all of the events that go into the default broker. So I'm going to go and uh, just add a trigger. And I'm going to keep the filter clear for now. And we can now see that there's a connection between the default broker and our display function, uh, which you'll just see has been scaled down to zero because nothing is going to it right now. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to create a type of event source called a ping source. And that's going to give us some, <clears throat> that's going to give us some events to display. What this is basically doing is every minute it's going to pump out this hello OpenShift comments. Hey there, everyone, uh, event. And we're going to see that going into the logs of the display function. So check that out. We've already got our first event in here. And if we look at the topology view, we can see that there's the ping source connected to the broker and that the display function is listening or is, is getting events from the default broker via that trigger that we just set up. One thing I want to note here is that the channels that the events are moving through in this demo are backed by an in-memory implementation. In a real production scenario, we would want to have an implementation backed 
by some durable store so that we didn't lose events. On OpenShift, we'll be using Kafka for this purpose and future versions of OpenShift serverless and integration. So while our pink source keeps on happily producing events, let's do something a little bit more advanced. I'm going to run a pod in the cluster that lets me run curl so I can send events to the broker interactively. What I'm going to do is I'm going to run a command, a curl command, that is uh, producing a cloud event that says hello KubeCon. And we can see that went into our display function. So what if we're only wanting to, sing to see the ping source messages? We can add filtering based on the attributes of the message to do this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to edit the trigger. And we're going to add some um, attributes. We're going to say we only want to see the dev.knative dot sources dot ping type. We'll just head back to that play function log. And now if I just send the same event, it's not going to have the right type. And you can see those events are are not going into this log. So what we'll do is we are going to trick the trigger by changing the event type so that we're going to see this event show up. And you can see now we did get this event because we changed the type to dev.knative.sources.ping and it says hello kubecon. Um, so hopefully this gives you a fairly good idea of how these uh, broker and trigger primitives work in practice. They're very powerful tools for achieving loose coupling between producers and consumers of events. We hope that you will check out eventing in, as GA in OpenShift Serverless and check out our developer preview of functions. Thanks a lot. Back to you, Mike. All right, Paul, thank you for, for that demonstration. It's, um, you know, you had a net with the, um, the DR of the application. Can you imagine connecting that as a backend component of a larger serverless framework? It's, it's, it's really coming together. I, I can't wait to, to see this all in action. Um, and that, you know, really brings us to the end of our conversation. And it's been a really um, up and down 2020. Uh, with that, are there any parting thoughts, Derek or Clayton, that you want to leave us with? Uh, what you see is happening in Kubernetes. Okay, well, hopefully, Mike, you can hear me and I'll say it again. I think at Red Hat, we're all like passionate open source engineers and we work in a variety of upstream communities. And I think we're all just proud on a human level that during the COVID crisis, we've been able to be productive as a community to, to get new capabilities in all of our upstreams. Um, and so, uh, you know, as we look ahead to 2021, uh, I hope that we can keep sustainably working within our upstream communities to bring innovation to all of our users together. But I think uh, even with all the things that are happening in the world, like innovation never truly uh, stops, right? Stuff is always happening around us and things are evolving. So I would say like, I'm, I'm particularly interested in a number of the hardware innovations we see happening uh, across the data center today, whether that's like every everything you could attach to a computer is getting some level of intelligence associated with it. And we wanna be able to take advantage of that both inside the cluster with our workloads and potentially outside the cluster to orchestrate these systems. So uh, there's a lot of, Interesting excitements, uh, innovations I see coming in that space that I think will drive change in Cube, Linux, and the overall OpenShift distribution itself. 
Uh, so I think that's one of the areas that I'm particularly interested in seeing evolve in 2021. And Clayton? Yeah, and I agree with that, Derek. Um, there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of areas in the ecosystem that are going to grow, um, you know, heavily over the next few years. People have made huge investments in Kubernetes and building out this, um, you know, cloud native ecosystem. Um, there's always new capabilities that people are dreaming up to better connect their apps or, um, you know, to connect to data. I think, um, you know, for us, a focus, you know, where we're going to place some of our investment and our bets over the next few years really comes down to um, dealing with the complexity, right? There's none of this stuff is getting any simpler. And I think it's the open source community and the Kubernetes community and the folks um, who every day go and build these applications to build um, the simplifications that make building reliable services at scale easy, um, because it's, it's not getting harder every day. It's just getting the needs on us, um, the requirements, um, whether it's in industries that are uh, heavily regulated or industries where people's lives are at, uh, at risk. Um, you know, we need to think about the design and, um, you know, the reliability of everything that we help people build. So I'm super excited about the work that we're doing um, around, uh, you know, multi-cluster resiliency. I talked about the interconnections between clusters. I'm hoping, uh, you know, in another year or two, I'm going to be standing up here and um, you'll be programming applications to the Kubernetes model, but you won't think about where they're going because your operations team, your cloud provider, your service provider, um, Red Hat as a provider, we're all going to be working together to make your applications run where you need, and they will stay running, you know, throughout, you know, screw ups of config changes or application disasters or, um, you know, COVID-19, no matter what it is, uh, we want Kubernetes and the ecosystem around it to stay resilient. So I am extremely excited about that. Great points, both of you. And with that, we're at the end. And I want to thank both of you and everybody watching for keeping a tradition alive through all these virtual sessions. Uh, have the best KubeCon North America that you can, and we'll see you next